America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on Iraq. Our guest, Haider al-Abadi, served as Iraq's Prime Minister from 2014 through 2018. He demonstrated an interest in politics from a young age, joining the Dawa Party in high school and its executive leadership just after finishing his doctorate in electrical engineering at the University of Manchester in 1980. Prime Minister Al-Abadi later became the party's chief spokesperson and the head of its political bureau while living in exile in London. After the coalition invasion of Iraq in the spring of 2003 and the subsequent collapse of Saddam Hussein's brutal dictatorship, Al-Abadi returned to Iraq, serving as a member of the new government's parliament and chair of the Committee for Economy, Investment and Reconstruction. He is the author of Impossible Victory, How Iraq Defeated ISIS. Today, he leads the Victory Alliance Party, which he founded in 2017. Called the Cradle of Civilization, Iraq is home to the advent of writing, agriculture, and cities. The wealth and culture of the region drew the attention of Persian, Greek, and Roman empires, who successively conquered the area. Baghdad was the epicenter of the Islamic Golden Age, from the 18th to mid-13th century, until the Mongols challenged the Abbasid Caliphate and brutally sacked the city. In the 1500s, the Ottoman Empire seized control of Iraq and ruled until the end of World War I. British colonial rule began in 1918, until the country gained full independence as the Hashemite Kingdom of Iraq in 1932, under King Faisal I and King Faisal II. In 1958, the Hashemite kingdoms of Jordan and Iraq briefly united as the Hashemite Arab Federation to counter the union of Egypt and Syria as the United Arab Republic. Six months later, Iraqi officers deposed King Faisal II and established the Republic of Iraq under Prime Minister Abdel Karim Qasim. Members of the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party assassinated Qasim in 1963. The party quickly lost control of Iraq before regaining power in July 1968. Saddam Hussein consolidated power in Iraq in 1979, shortly after the Iranian Revolution. Hussein, a Ba'ath Party member since 1957, who participated in the 1963 coup, feared the Iranian Revolution would ignite a Shia-led revolution against his Ba'athist government. He invaded Iran in September 1980, and the two countries were at war for nearly a decade, until accepting a ceasefire agreement in 1989. In 1990, Saddam Hussein's Iraq invaded Kuwait. The United Nations Security Council responded with an embargo and sanctions against the country, and a U.S.-led coalition sent forces to the Gulf to defend Kuwait as part of operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. The coalition liberated Kuwait, but did not pursue regime change in Baghdad. Instead, the United States, Britain, and France established no-fly zones in Iraq with the goal of protecting ethnic Kurds in the north and the Shia minority in the south. In March of 2003, the United States invaded Iraq and toppled the Hussein government, but a clandestine Ba'athist network and a well-funded external Ba'athist organization survived the invasion and coalesced over time into a highly organized insurgency. Removing Saddam without a plan to secure the country unleashed centripetal forces of sectarian violence that grew out of the failure of Arab nationalism, the Iranian Revolution, the Iran-Iraq War, the aftermath of the 1991 Gulf War, and the brutality of the Ba'ath Party dictatorships. At first, insurgents directed violence and terrorism primarily at coalition forces, nascent security institutions, and political leaders but there was insufficient civilian capacity to stabilize the country. Military units had not been trained for counterinsurgency operations, and a few overreacted, 
and generated more enmity through heavy-handed tactics and breaches in discipline. The growing Ba'athist resistance subsumed nationalist and tribal recruits and forged an alliance with Islamists affiliated with al-Qaeda in Iraq. By 2004, the conflict morphed into sectarian civil war, but coalition leaders refused to acknowledge it. By 2005, they had shifted the strategy in Iraq to one of transition to Iraqi forces as an end in and of itself, even as the security situation worsened. In February 2006, al-Qaeda bombed the Al-Askari Mosque in Samira, one of Shiism's holiest sites. Afterward, Shia militia attacks on Sunnis mounted, Sunni militias sprouted and affiliated with al-Qaeda. Mixed neighborhoods underwent ethnic cleansings. By the end of 2006, the chaos of civil war had strengthened the influence of Iranian-sponsored Shia militias and accelerated the cycle of violence. In January 2007, President George W. Bush announced plans for a surge, a dramatic shift in the strategy for the war in Iraq that would aim to extend a Sunni tribunal awakening against al-Qaeda, defeat that terrorist organization, and nurture local ceasefires as part of bottom-up reconciliation efforts. In the year following the complete deployment of surge forces, violence in Iraq fell to the lowest level since 2004. Long-term military, diplomatic, and economic engagement was needed to ensure that Iraq remained stable and was not aligned with Iran. However, the new Barack Obama administration policy was resigned to any outcome in Iraq as long as the United States disengaged. U.S. diplomatic and military disengagement from Iraq cleared the way for the return of large-scale sectarian violence. The extension of Iranian influence over the Iraqi government and Shia population and the growth of a new version of al-Qaeda in Iraq, ISIS. Less than 30 months after the December 2011 end-of-mission ceremony for the U.S. command in Baghdad, Mosul fell in Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. In September 2014, as the terrorist organization ISIS seized control of territory the size of Great Britain and brutalized Syrians and Iraqis, Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi formed a broad-based government which included Sunnis and Kurds. He fought to unify Iraq in the fight against ISIS and brokered accommodations between communities to break the cycle of sectarian violence. As Prime Minister, al-Abadi led Iraq as its armed forces with U.S. support defeated ISIS and regained control of territory including Iraq's second largest city, Mosul. Iraq continues to face threats from jihadist terrorists, Iranian-backed militias, and the potential for a return of large-scale sectarian violence. We welcome Prime Minister al-Abadi to discuss the future of Iraq in the Middle East, the threat of Iranian influence in the region, and how to break the cycle of sectarian violence. Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi, it is wonderful to see you. Marhaba. Welcome to Battlegrounds. And, you know, it was such a pleasure to get to know you in Iraq many, many years ago, the work that we did together in Nineveh province and Talafra, and then to see you again when I was National Security Advisor and you were serving at Prime Minister, as Prime Minister at a very, very difficult, challenging, harrowing time uh, for Iraq. You're a great leader. Welcome to Battlegrounds. Great, great to see you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to see you again. Although when we met, uh, probably it wasn't the best times for Iraq at the time. Uh, Al-Qaeda was very active. Uh, there were a lot of killings, a lot of bombings, a lot of terrorist activities. But I think we are here now. Yeah. Well, and, and I was I was grateful for your work. And and, and uh, then then Mayor Najm, now Governor Najm in, in Nineveh province, the work that you did to, to foster accommodation between various groups in Iraq, reconcile people and and reduce support for the, the ch- terrorists, the takfirin uh, associated with al-Qaeda and the, the various militias that were feeding the cycle of sectarian violence. And your know, Prime Minister, I'd like to just ask you a little bit about your personal experience to share it with our viewers, because you know, you went through a lot of difficult times. You grew up in difficult times in, in Iraq. You you lived under under the the terrible oppression of of Saddam Hussein's Baathist regime. Your family suffered tremendously from that. I remember when you returned to Iraq, and when I first met you it was in April of two thousand and three, I think. And you went to the prison with your mother, 
in the hope that you would find your brother there and, and you found out that he had been he had already been murdered uh, by the regime. So could you just talk about your experience in Iraq up to the point of 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 the the attack into Baghdad in 2003 and the elimination of the Ba'ath Party regime? Yes, I remember that moment when, uh, of course, although my brothers, they were arrested in uh, one in 1980 and the other one 1982. Uh, but we always thought, because we never heard anything about them. So we thought uh, they are in secret prisons. We were hearing a lot of rumors. They were held in secret prisons. Uh, some people will leak to us some information here or there. And uh, we assumed they were there. But uh, I remember April 2003, I was watching uh, I was watching a TV program at the time. It was from Six the Prison of Saddam. And they showed a document with two of my brothers uh, being executed in 1983. Oh. See, although that was 20 years earlier then, but to us, to me and to my mother and other brothers, it as if it happened now, because we just found out now. Uh, and of course, it was uh, much more uh, uh, hurtful when you try to find their graves, but there is no trace. There is nothing. Either these documents have been, uh, been um, damaged or they've been hidden. Uh, I know the regime usually keeps a detailed description of whatever crime they did, uh, is similar to what Hitler was doing. I think they would document all the, their crimes for their own reasons, of course. But, uh, of course, we, we reached a dead end where we couldn't find their graves. But anyway, there was, there, there were buried somewhere there. I know they were buried in Baghdad. The resting ground is there. This is the city where we have lived, we have grown up. Uh, but we have to put all of this... Uh, uh, I think revenge will never help us. Vendetta will never help us. But we have to be careful that what happened before is never going to be repeated. We shouldn't allow dictators and oppressors to govern the country anymore. We should work very hard and we shouldn't become oppressors. That's why when I become prime minister, my my fear number one is to become a dictator. You see, you see power can corrupt people can lead them to absolute authority. And I was very careful not to be uh, in, 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 in such a, a situation. You know, when, when we worked together uh, closely, 2005, 2006 period, and really into 2007, 2008, I was, I was struck by your humaneness and, and the degree to which you had, your family had suffered, but you maintained your humaneness and your determination uh, to help bring uh, Iraqis together. You served as a minister and a parliamentarian, um, in, 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 after the fall of the of the Baathist re regime, and and uh, and you saw Iraq encounter new difficulties, right? This growing insurgency that was that was localized and hybrid initially, but but coalesced and allied itself with the the Takfirin, the the, the uh, Salafine groups associated with Al Qaeda, and then you saw the the beginning of the sectarian violence, really. In 2004, it started with, you know, the Zarqawi letter that people forget about, where he said he wanted to jumpstart really a sectarian civil war on the Afghan model, is what he called it. Can you just describe your experience and and your observation of this this growing insurgency and violence in Iraq after 2003, and then how it morphed uh, into this sectarian civil war, this fitna uh, that 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 tore Iraq apart. Uh, to be honest with you, we never anticipated that. Uh, when we were in exile before Saddam regime was toppled, uh, I mean, everybody thought the U.S. is a superpower. They have all the capabilities to control the country, to prevent terrorists from getting in, to, to, to prevent the Ba'athists from doing whatever crimes they did then later. And nobody has anticipated things will be uh, left loose as it is. I mean, we, we, did, we didn't have borders. I remember when I entered into Iraq, there were no borders. You just get in without anything. Even the, the passports were not stamped. I remember I seen a, one U.S. soldier uh, holding his rifle. He, his, his, his face was like a tomato because of the hot weather at the time. And, uh, and he was relaxed. There was no confrontation. 
But of course, uh, terrorists, uh, would-be terrorists, are not relaxed. They were planning, especially when we know that Saddam has invited thousands of would-be terrorists and suicide bombers to the country before his, his demise. Uh, in preparation, because he thought he will have a fight. He thought we, he will uh, lengthen the, the confrontation with the U.S. and its allies. He thought it, it, he will continue with this war until he wins it. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, he uh, that led to his demise. And these people stayed in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, there, there are many come. But I look at it like this. I know most people have their good side and their bad side. I usually have a faith in the people. And I usually appeal to the good side, good side of these people. And you can win or sometimes you fail because if that person doesn't want to follow his good side, it's up to him. I, I cannot change that, but I can convince them. I can influence them. At least I will not be a reason for them to follow their bad side. If they choose to follow their bad side, it's not me. I encourage them to go in the right direction. That's how I deal, even, even with, with the people who probably we imagine them as terrorists. And we have seen it in Tel Aviv. I mean, we're meeting with people and we know they have connections with terrorists at the time. But we don't know whether they're in bed with them, either sympathizers, are they cooperating with them, or are they just in a difficult situation? And we're trying to help them to get out of that situation. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. So we have to have that uh, humane, uh, what you call it, humane, which is uh, in line with the humanity. I mean, people have, both sides in them. And nobody is absolute evil and nobody is absolute angel, probably apart from prophets or people who are chosen by God. They are completely different. But uh, we are talking about normal people and normal people are laying this. So it's not up to us to judge people. We can judge the acts of the people. We don't know what is in their hearts. Uh, some people commit arts, which uh, if they kill innocent people, I think they have to be punished. They have to be held accountable. So I think, uh, to me, this is a success. If you go to the other direction, you will become a dictator or a person because you'll be judging people by their own intention, which you don't know what is in their hearts. Yeah. Well, Prime Minister, I, I'm really grateful for your leadership at a very difficult time for Iraq because I, I, I felt good in 2008, 9, 10, right? It seemed as if you know the, the situation in Iraq was much more secure and and of course, we had, you know, the contested election 2009 between uh, Prime Minister Maliki, who remained in office, and, and Ayad Alawi. That created some difficulties. You had the complete withdrawal of, of U.S. forces in December 2010, which in retrospect, you know, was premature. But then you also had these sectarian policies, you might call them, or, or narrow policies of the Maliki government that I think helped to really start again. Uh, the the uh, the insurgency and created the belief among some of the Sunni communities in in Iraq uh, that that these Takfirin groups, Al Qaeda, which became ISIS, uh, could could be patrons and protectors of these beleaguered communities. And I, I I do not know of any other leader that was thrust into a more challenging situation than you were. You took over the prime ministership after you won the election and formed a coalition government um, as ISIS was gain, gain control of territory the size of Britain in, in, in Iraq and in Syria. And we all remember the image of al-Baghdadi, this criminal uh, walking up the stairs in, 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 the, in the mosque in, in Mosul. Uh, could you explain to our viewers just what it was like for you to assume leadership under these extremely challenging conditions and then, and then what you did uh, to begin to deliver what you call the title of your book, to deliver an impossible victory? Uh, over these tax fearing groups? Yeah, it was catastrophic. In a sense, if you talk about military sense, we had uh, something like six division would completely uh, uh, collapse. And uh, we are talking about figures now. Uh, but the, the, this is only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is we have many other divisions. They may have lost 30%. 25%. But these 30% are vital for, their, for them to function. You see, sometimes some parts of these divisions are very vital. Without them, the 70% is not useful at all. They cannot do much without the 30%. So we have that. And the second one is that you have a very oppressive uh, 
uh, terrorist organization controlling the landscape and made people very fearful. Right. And, um, and just and just yeah. just to notice for or just to know for our viewers, I mean the the mass murders, you know the 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 mass rapes, the you know the the abuse of women and children. It was, <laughs> you know, and, and of course you and I have encountered these people close up. These are. These are horrible criminals uh, who inflicted tremendous suffering on, on the Iraqi people. Yeah, I give you an example in Salahuddin, just uh, after, uh, the, uh, after, I think, 11th of, uh, of June, within three days, they've uh, massacred uh, almost 2,000 cadets. They were civilians. They were cadets. They didn't have, hold arms. Their ages range between 18 and 22. And in cold blood, a lot of them, they threw their, uh, their bodies in the river, some of them in mass graves. So it was very bad. But the most dangerous bit of that, which I've seen, is the collapse of morals. That was very dangerous. It's not, I mean, if there are divisions of the animal collapse, you can rebuild them. If you lost arms, you can get more arms. You can train people. You can address the crimes, but morals, you need a lot of work. You see, from experience, I did study this in nations, in military, and you are a military person. And you know some soldiers or even commanders who have faced a very dangerous situation may impact themselves. They never go back as they were. I do have commanders. I remember they will be subjected to terrorist bombing, to quite a catastrophic explosion. They never liked before. So I usually appreciate this in them. And I don't put them in a very difficult situation. They're good, they're good military people, good commanders, but their ability has been reduced from before for something which is outside them. So you have to be very careful. Now, when a nation or the whole military have their morals diminished so far, they feel that the enemy, as some military commanders are telling me they are ghosts. They appear from everywhere. We don't know where they appear from, from the dark, from something which we have not seen before. Um, uh, they have so many numbers, but you see these terrorists, they have uh, very good manipulation, where in many, many confrontation, we found there are only probably 15 of them or 12 of them, mm -hmm. but they were moving between houses to make it appear as if you are facing an army, not only a small group of terrorists. And usually you know that probably from your experience, Uniform army are not uh, suitable to face up with terrorist organization. Uh, they are in completely two different uh, categories uh, because armies, they have their own laws, their own discipline, their own things which they have to do or they don't have to do or they are not allowed to do. While terrorists are not like that, they can manipulate the situation, they can hold people hostage. Uh, they can threaten people where military or uniform military or abide by the law cannot do this. So I think that was the major challenge. You have to rebuild these fighters, the commanders, from the scratch almost. You have to rebuild the public perception of fear of what happened. It's not easy, especially when I know the level and uh, the, 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 the collapse which has happened, the damage which has happened. But sometimes you cannot tell people the truth because even they will be more uh, down in their morals. And you have to face it your own. You have to rebuild the door. I think that was the challenge number one. Challenge number two, uh, as we've uh, talked before, I mean, terrorists, they cannot succeed without uh, a base of support. And there were many, and especially in the Sunni areas, who felt that they lost a state which belongs to them by the fall of Saddam Hussein. And they thought they have lost that status. And they seen the new administration as if, as you mentioned, Bobby Sectarian against them. They were not running a state which is considering every citizen is a citizen by his own account. But they look at his sect, at his religion, which of course is very harmful. And this has probably pushed some people to be uh, 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 like uh, a, a, a bed or what do you call it? Uh, right. A, a tacit support, support for, right? Tacit yeah. support for the terrorists, you know. And, and yeah. so, some some of uh, my uh, people who I, I establish very good contacts now and relationship with people in Alamadi, people in Alambar, in Nainawa, and they tell me we remember during that time 
when an explosion by terrorists happened in Baghdad, we'll celebrate. We'll celebrate as if something good happened. It's going to weaken the Baghdad government. It's going to weaken those who came with, uh, as they say, or at the back of the U.S. tanks with the equipment. Although that was not the case, to be honest with you. But that's how they perceive it, as if they've lost the state to, to others. So I have to work very hard to convince our population in these areas. We care about them. This government, look at them as citizens. They don't look at them whether they share Sunni, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, or they're Kills or Arabs. We see them as citizens. It's not easy, especially with a lot of sectarianism around you, and uh, they will not let you let you alone. Whatever you, that you do, they try to manipulate it, to change the narration to a different narration. It's not easy. But the important thing here, you should not lose track. You should be consistent. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of doing it once, two, three times and say, well, I give up. No. You have to be very consistent that people will believe you. It took me almost a year or over a year uh, to do this. So people started to believe us. Before, they didn't believe us. We tell them, you see, I remember in the uh, beginning of 2015, we had a lack of soldiers. So since our army wasn't balanced in terms of Shia and Sunni, so we tried to, to recruit many Sunnis in our army so that they will help in liberating their own land or, or their own their cities. But to be honest with you, we have none. They didn't believe us. Till that time, they didn't believe us that we look, we, we want them with us. We are looking at them as citizens. Uh, the, the, the defense minister at the time was Sunni. He says, I'm sorry, I want soldiers. So I have to recruit from the Shia. Sunnis are not coming forward. So I said, well, look, we have to be consistent with that. We have to push very hard. We will win at the end of the day. See, it, it's, it's not easy, especially when you have all sorts of commanders, people around you who believe otherwise. So, well, this is an unsuccess. You're not going to win this. This is a war of attrition. You're not going. You're never going to to win it. Is is I think that was a huge challenge, which we have achieved at the end of, the, uh, end of this process. You know, I, you remind me of the, when we were working together on Talafer. We tried to recruit Sunnis into the police force and into the army, and we could get zero, none, a, a, until after the operation, after Iyada Al Haq, right, the uh, restoring yeah. rights. Then we had thousands volunteer because also it's important to remember, I think, that the terrorists will hold their families hostage and will kill family members of, of anybody who tries to defend the territory. But, you know, I, it, as, if, I'm sure our viewers are getting an appreciation for how difficult the leadership challenge was for you. But complicating it even further uh, was the role of neighbors, I would say Iran in particular, and, 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 the, and the response in terms of the raising of the of the militias, the PMF forces, uh, that were not under direct government control oftentimes. And so that's just another whole level of complexity. How did you how did you cope with the PMF, which is still, I know, a problem in, in Iraq now? We saw the recent violence, but but how did you over time uh, really allay the concerns of the Sunni population and 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 try to restrain these militias so they didn't become part of the problem for you? Yes, I think uh, we did have something on our side at the time, although I say on our side in a different sense, that Daesh threat was not only to Iraq, it was also to Iran. Don't forget, Daesh almost in Diyala reached the border of Iran. Yeah. And Daesh, of course, were very anti Iran as well, because they consider Iran as a Shia. And, and, and for Shia our fight. viewers, I'll just say Daesh is ISIS. They're one and the same, right? Yes. Uh, sorry. And uh, so the Iranians really felt threatened. I mean, this is a real threat to them. There's no, they cannot manipulate it. It's very dangerous. Uh, they cannot allow it to spread. So I think in their own heart, they were very eager to get rid of, to fight them. So I think that was on our side, that we can use their support in fighting against the Ash. Yes, I, I agree. The Iranians have uh, had, a, 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 I think, a, a massive history. I mean, very, very astonishing history as a, a, a Persian empire, which goes back probably 2000, more than 2000 years ago. 
although it has become a Muslim state, I think like uh, maybe 1,000 years ago, and then it is transformed to Shiism, I think 500 years ago, it was a Sunni state. But still, I think uh, is, a, is a great empire. It has a, a great uh, history. So I think uh, how they govern is this. That's how they see things. In order to protect their kingdom, they have, must keep others busy. Yeah. They must to defend themselves. They don't wait for the enemies to come to their doorstep. They go to them. And I think they've seen Daesh as a real threat to them. Because don't forget, in Iran, there are many scenarios. And there are some, some of them are restless. So Daesh will be a huge threat to Iran and to the whole regime. And I think they were very sincere in supporting us and in helping us to combat this terrorism because our interests with their interests are, are the same on this in particular. So I think that helped us quite a lot. But I agree. They wanted the leverage as well. I mean, this, uh, although this is a threat to them, but it's an opportunity as well. And I reckon every, every country who have, uh, who have uh, uh, interest, they thought, I'll, I'll probably, I'm not saying a secret, but one of the, when Iranian leader, and I was talking frank with him, do you really feel that the U.S. presence in Iraq at the moment, where we are, I mean, the U.S. didn't have many, much for, many forces during my time. They were only helping Iraqis to fight. They were not even fighting on the ground. And I told him, do you really feel the U.S. presence in Iraq is a threat to you? He said, no. I said, well, why then you talk about U.S. presence and you are afraid of this? What he told me, he says, the U.S. is a great power. And they have quite a discipline. And their commanders, they don't have a huge army in Iraq at the moment. So they're not doing bad things like it was after the occupation, where late soldiers may do bad things. Uh, I mean, any army, they have people who are not disciplined, they will, and that can. They have commanders, and usually they have a very good uh, relationship with your commanders, and they treat them very well according to the law, and they respect Iraqi sovereignty, and they're going over time to win over Iraqi commanders. And I told him, well, look, this is a very good thing. You do the same. And then you can have friendship with Iraqi commanders, with the Iraqi army. So I think to, to say this, see, every country will look after its interest in its own way. Yeah. While the U.S. have that doctrine, well, the Saudis have different doctrine. They think they buy people by their own money. The Turks will appeal to the people who have a Turkish origin or who are Sunni, close to them. Yeah. And the Iranians, they do the same. See, each one will do it according to his culture, according to the things he is doing things with it. But here in Iraq, the thing is, you have to understand what others think. I think sometimes you have to put yourself in their shoes to understand why they are doing this. Otherwise, I will end up like uh, dealing with <laughs> like a, a deaf argument with yeah. somebody who has different understanding from me. And I think... Uh, Sometimes, I know myself, I have the ability to be in the other side shoes, to see things from their perspective. I may disagree with them completely, but at least I can understand them. And I know how to deal with them without giving in, without giving in about Iraqi interests, about Iraqi sovereignty and other aspects. So it needs dedication and you have to be very careful. Sometimes the lines... Uh, uh, separating the two is very fine. Uh, I think between uh, between being uh, uh, loyal to your country or between being loyal to another country, sometimes the line is not clearly defined. You have to be very careful. And I'm, I'm sure you are as a military commander, you have been through this. Uh, but uh, to me, you have your own uh, values. And you have to keep these values under very tough situation. It's not easy for a commander or a leader to do this. Well, but Prime Minister, I, I, can't, I can't imagine a more difficult situation that you were in than with, you know, with so many different, you know, uh, countries in your neighborhood trying to exert <laughs> influence in, in Iraq. And well, you know, what I used to say to, well, I think to you and to, to all of my Iraqi friends is the fundamental difference, I think, between the United States 
interests in, in Iraq and, and the way that we're, that we're pursuing U.S. interests there and Iran is that the United States, I think, tried to, to help strengthen Iraq at every step of the way. And I do think that the Iranians are trying to keep the Arab world perpetually weak and enmeshed in conflict with the support for, you know, for, for the PMF site militias in Iraq or Houthis in Yemen or Assad's proxy army in, in, uh, uh, in, in Syria or Hezbollah, you know, in, 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 um, in, in Lebanon. So I think that just complicates it even more for you. Could you, could you talk to our viewers about what work you did politically to, to, to sort, sort of arrest these centripetal forces of sectarian violence and bring Iraqis back together to accommodate with one another and come to an internal political settlement. Because I remember you know, when I was national security advisor, just to add another level of difficulty for you, you had a Kurdish independence referendum at the same time. So how, how, did, how did you work inside of Iraq to help strengthen Iraq's uh, you know, identity and, 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 uh, and I guess you know, the uh, political resilience uh, of, of the country? Well, A, you have to be very focused on what you want to achieve. And B, there, were, there will be many political players who are trying to push you off track. You have to be very careful. Maybe uh, because I was patient, I was not replying to their own provocations. And maybe a lot of things, uh, uh, you see, people sometimes they look at you as a leader and sometimes they want you to be robust, to be hard with others, especially in the country which was under dictatorship for many years. Mm -hmm. They love uh, a strong man. I was a strong man at the time. I was fighting terrorism. Uh, I was fighting terrorism and sectarianism and uh, ethnic infighting. Uh, so I have to be very focused. I know this can drag me. I mean, you always have a, a this, uh, uh, an instinct to protect yourself, to defend yourself. But sometimes I have to abstain from defending myself because that will cause many other problems. I can say things which can damage what I'm trying to do. And probably this cost me the, the second term of premiership. Uh, because although I was very open with the people, but there are many things which I didn't explain. I didn't uh, uncover because it can cause a lot of uh, hatred. It can cause uh, a lot of problems and friction, which will take me off the track, what I'm trying to do. It's tough. It's hard. Uh, but this is, I think, I consider my strength. To me, I have uh, a dedication when I was first nominated to become a prime minister, I said my number one uh, duty is to liberate the country from ISIS, from Daesh. I didn't mention any other thing uh, because we, I uh, don't forget, at that time, we almost lost our country. Yeah. Every thought that Iraq has gone. And many people were preparing they, to leave the country. They thought there is no future. Daesh will come to the south will separate the country and divide it. And a lot of people thought they have to make, they went to Syria, some people went to Iran, some people went to Europe. The, the, the trend in immigration was so huge. I only managed to reverse that in 2016. People were coming back because they've seen that, ah, the entity of the state is there. We're not going to lose it. So at that time, that was a goal, a main goal, a main objective in my policy. I don't want to go off track in that. That was still dangerous, even in 2016-17. Don't forget, yeah. Daesh or ISIS is very lethal. You shouldn't underestimate it. It's like, uh, uh, what do you call it? I mean, um, <laughs> is something which you may damage 50% of it, yeah. but the other 50% will be very lethal. They can come back. They can multiply. It's an ideology. It's bad ideology. False ideology, but it's very powerful. And they are prepared to go to a length. I remember seeing uh, some uh, terrorist fighters in the desert. You cannot imagine how they are surviving. Don't forget. I mean, I have to say something here, which probably I never said it anywhere. My heart was bleeding when we have to kill these young people, the terrorists. Yeah. 
Don't forget, these are young people. They've been misled. Oh. Maybe some of them, some of them have sacrificed. They've sacrificed their positions, their studies, and they thought they are defending their countries. They're defending their nation. They thought they are doing something which is very good, which serves their own religion. But they have been led astray. They went quite away. And sometimes it bleeds your blood, your heart, that you have to do this to save the country, to save other people. So, I mean, this is a goal which is very sacred to me. And I think I stayed on course. Uh, see, uh, I was subjected to a lot of media, a lot of attacks, things which are lies. Um, I, when I took the premiership, I didn't have enough resources. Don't forget the oil prices dropped to about 2022. And the, the average oil price in the three years, although it's the fourth year, which I couldn't make use of much of that rise in oil prices, but in the three years, it was average like something like 40% of what it was before me. So it was very tough uh, in, in that situation. And uh, I think this is one reason for the success. Whatever happens, you should succeed in your goal. Uh, probably in a lot, for a lot of leaders, the goal is to be reelected. Yeah. The goal is to be to be to come in second term, and they can sacrifice a lot of things. Uh, and uh, I think you have to be popular with your own with your own idols rather than popular with the 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 voting. I think the votes can go up and down, regardless of what you do. Sometimes it, it it's subjected to other factors. Well, you know, your book is entitled "Impossible Victory." I think a man of of less character. Uh, we could not have succeeded uh, at, at, in overcoming all these challenges. And of course, Iraq is still in a difficult situation today, right? Your successor, Mustafa al Qadami, who I've also had the privilege of knowing over, over many years, uh, it maintain, is, it may, is still the prime minister because after the last election, no coalition government could be formed. And we've seen assassination attempts on, on his life, uh, sponsored in part, I think, by, by Iran. Um, or at least Iranian-backed militias tried to assassinate him. And then, of course, in recent in recent weeks and, and months, we've seen intra-Shia violence uh, in, 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 in Iraq as well that, that threatens security in the capital city and, and more broadly. Can you just explain to our viewers the internal dynamics in Iraq today, what you're doing, you know, what you're doing to try to bring communities again to uh, back together uh, and, and to reduce the threat of violence? And and what your prediction is for the future? How do you see things today in Iraq politically, and and from a security perspective, and and and, and what what is your what is your prediction about about the future of Iraq? I think something uh, happened in 2018, which is very drastic and very unfortunate. I mean, when I started 2014, we almost don't didn't have the military. We have some residual, but we have built that military. Uh, till 2018, and it was very powerful military. And uh, I have to remind you, 2014, a lot of Sunni areas were calling on the army to leave their areas. In 2018, they were calling on the army to stay in their areas because they've seen the army as a national defending of. So we have transformed the whole landscape. The army, although we didn't change much of their soldiers, but we changed the behavior of the army to save the people. And they are seen like national army to serve the people. That has and it was become very powerful because is uh, they fought heroically, and we had very good uh, apparatus in 2018. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of political force and with others, they thought they can they have to take the country to control it, and the two main militias have joined forces to form a government. And they did establish a coalition then, which is the Sadrists and the Fatah, which is mainly the militias. And the, the unfortunate thing is many other forces, they agreed with this. They thought uh, we are safe. Uh, the terrorists have gone. The country at that time, because I've saved a lot of money, has become rich. I don't waste whatever money there was. And I left uh, quite a surplus during my last year. And uh, they thought uh, they can take over and they can lead it to the right position. The unfortunate thing is that we saved the country from going downhill to a very successful or would be successful country. 
the unfortunate thing, they took us to a side road down the hill again. Um, I think that was, in my opinion, something which even our friends, our allies didn't see. Uh, they thought uh, they did, didn't look at it as it is. They thought it's okay. It's a coalition government. But that coalition government, I did, I did give a warning then. This coalition government is controlled by armed groups. This is very dangerous. This is going to weaken the state. Is going to weaken the security forces. Don't forget, what, what is the benefit of ha having a judiciary when you don't have forces which apply the law, apply the judgment of the judiciary? If the security forces in your, in your own hand, you cannot do much. These security forces are not, not going to protect the people. They are going to protect those who are answerable to their parties, yeah. their leaders, what, whoever they are. Uh, and that is not going to change. Now, every four years, we have a new prime minister. So commander-in-chief can change. But these leaders of these groups are not going to change. They're for life, almost. You know, I mean, in, in, in our region, yeah. uh, politicians stay for life, almost. Like Absolutely. religious leaders, they stay for life. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 so this is a problem. A problem which happened in 2019 and has continued. Now, to reverse it, we have to strengthen the state. Of course, uh, I'm not calling to fight against armed groups inside the country because these armed groups, they have politicians, they have members of parliament, they have influence in the state. It's a lost case if you fight against them. And if you fight against them, to be honest with you, we are going to sacrifice our own young people, whether it's on their side or on our side. So it's, it's, it's a lost battle. But what we have to do to balance that and strengthen the state and to make the state responsible for protecting the people because the state will be uh, like balanced state, which looking at citizens the same. And uh, I think this is the way forward. We have lost this and it's very unfortunate. Now that's why we see this infighting between militias and the infighting has become much more dangerous because both militias on both sides they're being armed by the state. Uh, the salary is being paid by the state. They use the logistics of the state and the fighting among themselves. They will, because they have a political agenda, they're not serving the people. They serve their own uh, followers or people who just uh, voted for them, which is really, uh, this is not right. When you are in a position of responsibility, you have to care about all the people, whether they voted for you or didn't vote for you whether they support you or don't support for you. Because you are when you are in a position of responsibility, you are representing all people, not only those who voted for you. Right. And, I know and, of course, what, what, you do right. and what makes it even more complicated is that now these groups are all stakeholders in the weakness of the state, because the weakness of the state is, is how they can continue to profit with you know government funding, criminal activity. But it also is what gives them impunity, right, to, to act is, is the weakness of the state. So I... I really hope that you and other leaders can strengthen state institutions and functions and 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 uh, and preserve, you know, what have been such such hard won uh, gains in security. And, you know, I, there's so much more we could talk about, but I'd like to ask you just uh, just one final question, maybe to to sort of step back from uh, uh, from Iraq itself a little bit and look at the region and Iraq's relationship with countries in the region. One of our priorities when I was national security advisor was to try to help you in any way I could, but also, but also to, uh, to, to foster Iraq's integration uh, in, into the region and to foster better relations uh, with Gulf states. I know that you, that was a big priority for you as, as prime minister. How do you see the, the future of Iraq's relationship to its neighbors and, and in the Middle East broadly? Uh, I think we have gone a long way in this, uh, which we, I started at the time. And don't forget, uh, Mustafa Al-Kalami, the, the public, present prime minister, he was the head of intelligence at the time. Yeah. And I was very much relying on him in uh, our relationship with the Gulf states. So we, he did have that advantage before he stood. And he carried on the same policy, which is a very good policy. I think now our position is good. We have to keep that. And we have even to strengthen more. Um, I've talked to Mr. al that really I was hoping at the time to move even further by establishing a comprehensive relationship in terms of uh, energy, in terms of electricity, in terms of water projects. So our interests will be like, uh, like uh, 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 well, together 
for for the interests of the people. So future government, if they disagree, they cannot break the relationship because the relationship will be very solid because it's embedded in the interests of the people. People will have a common interest. They cannot break it. And then we'll move out of the war zone. I mean, there will not be wars in the future because if you have so much common interest, each one will see the interest of continuing good relationships. That is my aim. And of course, but we're trying to build this against a huge background of enmity and fighting and historical problems. Don't forget, this region lives in history. And the history is, is very, I mean, there's a lot of things happening in the history where Turks, they consider part of Iraq is still their own. They are very much uh, looking forward for an opportunity to take it back, the same with the Iranians, the same possibly with other Gulf states. Is uh, There is also each country trying to find its place in current uh, crisis of the economy, especially uh, post-Ukraine. I think the whole world is not a very nice place at the moment, where uh, the, the, the especially poor people are disadvantaged in this. Uh, I know even the rich continents like Europe is really suffering, and they are in a very dangerous challenge in that regard. Uh, so I think uh, this makes things much more difficult because, yes, I can have a good attention with others. I can look at the leaders and nation, the current nations in our neighborhood, but a lot of people cannot escape history. They look back at history. They were controlling us. They were colonizing us. They were doing this to us. And this still lives in the people. See, I think we have this challenge. So my call on all the leaders, yes, I don't telling them to ignore history. History is back of their own present being. But uh, we have many areas. And we have a common interest now. Let us not go to these differences. I'm not saying that ignore all differences. Keep it there. Keep it on a very slow fire. Let them mature gradually. Uh, but uh, put greater emphasis on things which of, is of common interest to us. There is We don't disagree on the importance for it for us and them. And this is quite large, to be honest with you, quite large. So can we form like a, a common market for some country? L can we form like a free movement of labor in our country? I mean, this is a good thing to happen. We, yes, you need a lot of control there. But can we move forward with this so that everything will benefit? Everyone will benefit. I mean, the other nations will benefit. We will benefit. I think this is a major task, which if you move very quickly, there are forces who doesn't like it. Yeah. They're going to sabotage it. If you go very slowly, um, then you'll not reach your aim because uh, over time you'll be weaker and weaker and the benefit you are getting year after year, it doesn't equal the, 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 the going back, which is continuing. So I think you have to draw a balance where you have to add up something every year. You don't go back. You have to build every step, every corner, every block, and you have to move forward. Even there are small things like allowing uh, contractors to work in, in, in both countries. I mean, that's a huge step if you do it. Uh, it. It can start something of common interest. You see, money, you know, money doesn't know sect, doesn't know religion, it doesn't know ethnic origin. You, you can see black and white people work together if it is a, an interest in the money. But we, when they go to their probably ideological differences, they cannot work together in, in that regard. <laughs> so <laughs> interest and money can bring people together. Right. Well, I, I think this has just been a tremendous discussion. I can't thank you enough. You know, one of the themes of, of this uh, uh, of, of the series is strategic empathy is the term that we use. We borrowed from a historian named Zachary Shore. And the idea is to, to view complex challenges and opportunities from the perspective of others. You've helped us do that because I think you're a fundamentally an empathetic person. <laughs> and I'd like to just give you the last word. Is there any final thing you'd like to say to our to our viewers? Yes. I think we have uh, many challenges in the world. At the moment. I have to remind you, I know sometimes uh, you have this in the U.S. and other countries where you concentrate on your own affairs. So 
hell. It's got nothing to do with us, what's happening in the rest of the world. But it does matter. We have seen uh, COVID-19. It has transformed the world, right. all the world. And you have wars. We have, you have now Ukraine war. Ukraine is at the edge of Europe, next to Russia. And nobody thought it can influence like grain. It can influence prices of many commodities for all the people. It can influence energy. I mean, come on, this is a small country. Probably smaller than, well, in, in areas larger than Iraq, I think, but in population is, is, is close to Iraq. But it has impact the, the whole world. So you cannot separate things. You cannot live, I cannot live with an isolated borders, especially uh, I have to bring attention to uh, social media, which I'm very much supportive of uh, free speech or free media. But it has become very dangerous. People with conspiracy, people with the know-how can manipulate many nations, can manipulate many people. I know it will come at the end to a balance, uh, but I think we have to do something about it. It's, it's become very dangerous. It can lead people to a different direction where they, to, where they want. Uh, now, I think uh, democracy is at threat. I believe this. Uh, you have uh, to look at the US as president. You have to look at Europe, where the far right are winning in many areas. Uh, you know that uh, the war of Ukraine is an aggression on a sovereign nation. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the Russian leadership should be punished. And that's what I believe in. Uh, but you see the opposite. I mean, the Russian leader probably is managing to cause more damage on Europe and to influence waters in Europe, higher oil prices, higher energy prices. And I think, and this has been utilized by the social media. This is the danger. I'm not calling on curtailing the social media, but I think people who are caring about people at large, humanity at large, must do something about it. I think we have to support the truth in the social media. And we have to minimize the lies and manipulation of the social media. It's dangerous. It's like uh, arms. You can give arms to people who are caring, but you shouldn't give arms to people who are killing innocent people. I think it's the same thing. Speech is a power. Yeah. If people use it in telling lies, manipulating others in the wrong way, yeah. it's dangerous. It can cause wars. It can cause enmity. It can cause divisions. It can cause civil wars in such society. So that's my last statement. Thank you. Prime Minister al thank thank you so much. I think education <coughs> is a big countermeasure to this disinformation. And you've helped educate me uh, and 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 our our, our audience. And uh, I can't I can't tell you how good it's it has been to see you on behalf of the Hoover Institution. Shukran. And uh thank you for being with us and and uh and 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 for giving us really a very wise perspective, uh, not only on Iraq, uh, but but also on on our world. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good. Our uh, friendship has lasted now seventeen years, or probably twenty years, almost. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say goodbye. Just say until until next time. And thank you for your okay. leadership, and and thank you for for joining us uh, on Battlegrounds. Well, thank you. Inshallah, looking forward to meet you again. Thank you. Masalama, masalama. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.